This video is going to look at the atomic structure of atoms at GCC level. We're going to look at how you represent atoms diagrammatically, what they are comprised of in terms of their subatomic particles, and also the electric configurations of atoms of different elements up to element 20, which is calcium. Before that, though, I really want to contextualize this diagram here with a little bit of history of our knowledge of the atom and the atomic structure. So the term atom is actually much older than people might initially believe. The first person to use the term atom in some form was the Greek philosopher Democritus uh, back in 460 BC. So he was having a philosophical debate um, about the nature of reality. And he surmised that all of creation was comprised of some indivisible portion which could be broken down which he termed atomos. Now, this idea of atoms didn't really catch on and lay dormant in the psyche of uh, both philosophers and scientists over the, the centuries that passed until the 1800s when a, an English scientist named John Dalton uh, sort of came back to the idea of atoms again, reprised his study of atoms, again, suggesting that they were these tiny particles that could not be broken down into anything smaller through chemical reaction which is very similar to our definition of atoms today. This required a weight of evidence to support. The first scientist to bring that supporting evidence was a guy called J.J. Thompson in 1889. Uh, he used um, an experiment involving cathode uh, ray tubes, which fire cathode rays through them. And he experimented with these rays, which weren't really well understood at the time, and found that they could be bent and deflected by negatively charged uh, plates or by magnetic fields. And he suggested the idea that these were actually beams of charged particles, which he termed electrons. He's the first person to discover electrons. He then thought about the atom uh, as a model again and thought they might be like, be like a plum pudding of these electrons surrounded by a, a vague cloud, nebulous cloud of positive charge. This was then picked up by uh, a man named Ernest Rutherford, a Kiwi, and other scientists in his team. They basically decided to test this theory by firing uh, alpha particles, which are helium atoms, at thin strips of gold foil. Now those gold atoms, if they were J.J. Thompson's plum puddings, shouldn't have offered much resistance to those alpha particles, those helium atoms should have flown straight through and been deflected to a very small extent. What happened instead is they were deflected back at the emitter. That suggested to uh, Ernest Rutherford there was something e deep in the atoms of gold that was um, much harder uh, and much denser than the plum pudding model would um, suggest. That led to the, uh, the, the, the theory of the nucleus of an atom, which we'll come on to in a second. Finally, you have the model here, which is the GCC model of an atom. It's actually known as the Niles Bohr model, after the Danish uh, physicist uh, Niles Bohr, uh, who in 1913 came up with the, uh, the idea through mathematical principles that the, uh, the atom is comprised of energy levels, uh, which we now call shells, in which the electrons must be found. And that gave birth to the model that you guys use at GCC. So let's just talk about the model quickly. The center of the atom is known as the nucleus. It is a very, very small region in which the heavier subatomic particles are found. And compared to the size of the atom itself, it is minuscule. Most of the atom's volume is actually comprised of not very much at all, just these energy levels, which we call shells, in which the electrons orbit. Electrons being very, very small, the, you know, the physical entity of an atom is actually uh, is incredibly um, non-existent. Not much in an atom, really, other than these subatomic particles. Now we're going to focus on these subatomic particles to a greater extent. There are three subatomic particles that compri comprise any atom. Hopefully you know their names. They are called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, just to emphasize this, I've actually given you the masses of protons and the charges here. So proton, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. These are tiny, infinitesimally small uh, subatomic particles, much smaller than the atom and much smaller than any scale we can conceive in, in our everyday lives. So... <clears throat> Very hard to sort of uh, to, to work with. Similarly, the charges of these particles is also incredibly small. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs for a proton. That's amperes or amps per second. And minus 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 for electrons. Their charges are, again, incredibly small. So in an everyday context, we can't really utilize these numbers. So we need to use much more simplified numbers to help us... Uh, you know, uh, understand them. And so that's where these relative mass numbers and relative charge numbers that you guys have to learn come in. What are they relative to? Well, there's two ways of looking at this. They're relative to 1 12th the mass of a carbon 12 atom. So 
1 12th of 12 is 1. So essentially, we're sort of saying here that one proton or one neutron is equivalent to the mass of a hydrogen atom, which makes sense because a hydrogen atom is just a proton with an electron orbiting around it, which has virtually no mass. So what we're saying here really is this relative uh, term is sort of saying the subatomic particles relative to each other have a certain ratio of mass, and we quantify that as being an atomic mass unit. But for your purposes, guys, they're simply very simple numbers rather than the very small complex numbers to represent the mass of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So a proton has a mass of one, one atomic mass unit, and it's reasonably a large on the scale of an atom for, in terms of mass. It has a relative charge of plus one. Protons are positive, kind of rolls off the tongue with the name proton. Neutrons also have a relative mass of one atomic mass unit. They're as, about as heavy and as large as um, having as, as much mass as protons. But they are neutral. They have no overall charge. Neutron, neutral. Again, it's kind of rolling off the tongue. Electrons, as you can see from the, the size here, they are much, much smaller than protons and neutrons. Uh, specifically, they are 1,836 times smaller than either a proton or a neutron. If you struggle to remember 1 over 1836 as a ratio or scale, just imagine the number is essentially zero. Electrons have almost no mass uh, on this scale, on this relative mass scale. They are negligible or zero mass. But they do still have a charge. Their charge is minus one compared to that of a proton, which is plus one. So they have the exact opposite charge of a proton. So to summarize this page, guys, uh, there are three subatomic particles in an atom, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positive and have a relative mass of one atomic mass unit. Neutrons are uh, neutral, but have a mass of one atomic mass unit. And electrons are negatively charged, one minus, but have uh, almost no mass, uh, relative mass at all. Okay, so let's think about this more specifically with the periodic table in tow. So the periodic table looks like this. This is a symbol for lithium. And in the uh, box for the symbol, you'll find two numbers for the, an atom of that element, seven and three for lithium. The top number, or the larger number, is known as the mass number, which is sometimes known as A. <clears throat> this is the total number of protons and neutrons found in the nucleus of that atom. The bottom number is known as the atomic number. And that just counts the number of protons. So it's a total number of protons found in the nucleus of an atom, of that atom, of that element. We can sort of compare or, 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 or consider this symbol with our knowledge of the structure and representation of an atom now. So where did I, how did I build this picture from this uh, particular symbol? First of all, the three. Three means the number of protons in the nucleus. So I've drawn three protons in the nucleus of this lithium because I know the atomic number tells me the total number of protons. I also know that protons are only found in the nucleus. Now, where did I get the other numbers from? Well, first of all, let's work out how I got this nucleus right. How did I know there were four green neutrons in the center of this nucleus? <clears throat> that was through this equation here. Number of neutrons is always calculated from an atom of an element as being equal to the mass number minus the atomic number. How does that work? Well, we know that the mass number is number of protons and neutrons, and the atomic number is just number of protons. So number of neutrons is equal to the number of protons and neutrons minus just the number of protons. And if I take the protons away, what I'm left with is the neutrons. So seven minus three equals four neutrons in the nucleus of lithium. How did I know there were three electrons in the outer, uh, in the shells, in the inner and outer shell? Well, how did I know there were three? That is going to come in with this idea here. Atoms of elements are considered to be electronically neutral as they possess no overall charge, which means this particle, as a sum, has no overall electrical charge. For that to be true, you must have equal numbers of positive protons in the nucleus and negative electrons surrounding that nucleus in the shells. So if I have three, if I have three protons, I must also have three electrons to balance out that positive charge with three negatives, hence why there are three electrons. So the atomic number not only tells me the number of protons directly, it also allows me to infer the number of electrons in an atom of any element, which is incredibly useful. This brings us finally on to electron configurations. So, <clears throat> here is an atom of calcium. 
And again, I've drawn the symbol of calcium 40, 20. I now know that the atomic number stands to the number of protons, so I know I have 20 protons. I also know that um, if this is an atom and element, and I know that atoms of elements are uncharged, I must have equal numbers of protons and electrons, so I also must have 20 electrons around my calcium nucleus, so I now know how many electrons I have to utilize. Then we have this electron configuration diagram, and, and there's a particular pattern we follow for these. The pattern's always the same, and so I'm going to teach that pattern to you now. The first inner shell, or energy level, is always the lowest energy level around the nucleus of an atom, and it has a maximum capacity of two electrons. Once two electrons occupy that shell, no more electrons can be added to that particular energy level. We have to move up to the next energy level to put more electrons around this nucleus. Energy level two, or shell two, has a maximum capacity of eight. So I put eight electrons in there, and then I fill that, that shell, and I can no longer put any more electrons in. So to put more electrons from my 20, I've used, only used 10 so far, I have to go out to the next energy level, the shell three. Again, I place eight electrons around, but I still haven't used up all my 20 electrons that calcium has to, to um, arrange. So that means I have to go out to the outermost energy level, which is the shell four, which actually has a capacity of up to 18 electrons. But luckily for you in the GCC syllabus, we only go as far as calcium. So I place my two outer electrons, my valence electrons, is the other name for outer electrons, in. And then I have finished my, my electron shell diagram. Now, that can be quite laborious. There is a simplified electron structure we can write, which simply tells me uh, how many electrons there are in each of the shells. So 2882 is the electron configuration of uh, calcium. Two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, eight in the third shell, and two in the fourth shell or energy level. So let's go through four of these quickly. <clears throat> Aluminium. <clears throat> Aluminium has, excuse me, <laughs> um, uh, the atomic number 13, which means it has 13 protons. I can deduce, therefore, it also has 13 electrons around its nucleus. So all I'm going to do is write AL for the nucleus of the atom, and then I'm going to draw three shells. Now, my pattern is I can place two in the first shell, then I've reached its complete, its full capacity. I can't put any more electrons in that shell. I have to move the next shell up to keep filling up the energy levels. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now I've reached the capacity of that second shell. That has only used 10 electrons. I have 13 to utilize. So one, two, three, and the electron configuration of that aluminium is complete. Two, eight, three. What about sulfur down here? Okay, same thing as before. S goes in the middle, and then you draw your shells. One, two, three. How many electrons go in the first shell? Two in the first shell. Then the second shell with capacity of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 10 electrons used up. I still have six to play with. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, by doing it singly, then doubling up, it helps to keep a nice, neat pattern. This will also really help when you're trying to do uh, <clears throat> covalent bonding diagrams. Finish it off with the shorthand version, two, eight, six, and that's complete. Fluorine comes next, same as before. F represents the nucleus of the fluorine atom. I'm only going to draw two shells this time because I don't need to draw three because I've only got nine electrons to play with. One, two in the first shell. Then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've used up all the electrons. I only had nine to play with. Two, seven is the electron configuration of a fluorine atom. Finally, magnesium. Twelve electrons to play with. Again, Mg represents the nucleus. One shell, two shell, and three shells. This time I'm going to count through to make sure I know I've used up all 12, so you can see how I'm doing this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve electrons are used, twelve electrons are distributed following the pattern 2882, but I've only had to use 12. So I've got two in the first shell, eight in the second, and two in the outermost valence uh, energy level or shell. So I hope that helps you guys with the basics of atomic structure. You've had a bit of a history lesson as well, and it should help with some basic uh, recapping and revision of atomic structure.